We're looking this morning at Acts chapter 14, going to begin reading in verse 21. We're finishing out our study on uh, Paul and Barnabas and their team's uh, first missionary journey. And next week, hopefully, we'll uh, look at what happened, their return. We'll begin to look in uh, Acts 15, moving from there to the Jerusalem Council. And then hopefully after my surgery, and I'm so thankful we have a number of capable individuals this church who will be preaching my absence during the surgery on uh, the 17th, the 24th, and the 31st. And as we begin the new year, hopefully we'll move into the second journey. But Acts 14, 21, as you're turning there, the name Jonathan Isaac may or, not, may, or may not be familiar to you, but you may remember his story. In the summer of 2020, Isaac stood out both figuratively and literally. He's an African-American professional basketball player who plays for the Orlando Magic. And at a time when so many athletes and coaches were kneeling during the national anthem, Jonathan Isaac decided to stand. And you couldn't miss him because he was six feet and 11 inches tall. You can the video of the event went viral, and uh, it was in, again, the summer of 2020, and it's almost amusing to look as you see uh, all of the coaches, the officials, and every single other player kneeling, and all of a sudden, a six foot 11, not abroad, but thin guy is standing up in the midst of it, and you sort of, your eye, even though he's to the right, jumps uh, toward that. After the game was over, uh, Jonathan Isaac was interviewed as to why he stood up, and he has no political persuasion. He doesn't choose one party over another. He did not do that to try to uh, put down anyone. He made it clear that as a Christian, it's important to stand against social injustice, and there are various ways to do that, and he emphatically said that. However, he says, I'm a minister, I'm an ordained minister of the gospel, and I believe in all of my heart I stood on the gospel of Jesus Christ because the answer to the world is Jesus. He said, and, and I'm paraphrasing, but in effect what he said is that we're all sinners and things will not get right until Jesus is in the rightful place. Again, not minimizing, not saying that Christians shouldn't take stand against injustices. He said, at that moment, I felt I needed to stand on the gospel. You know, every one of us should stand on the gospel. That's why we are involved in sending missionaries. We have to believe that the gospel is still changing hearts. And today we're looking at the conclusion of an exciting missionary journey that had gone on for about a year. And, and we're going to see that Paul and Barnabas, they're finishing that journey strong. We just mentioned a missionary earlier, and we need to pray for physical stamina to finish uh, strong. So here, almost a year after they begin the ministry, we see that Paul and Barnabas, they're still going to some new places, and they're also visiting other places. And why is that? Because they were convinced, just as Isaac, that the gospel is what people need today. You know, very early in the church, we see that Paul and Barnabas were commissioned by the church to take the gospel to places and to people who had yet to hear. And so we see as they're closing this journey, the great energy and great emphasis in the gospel. Look with me at Acts 14 and verse 21. After they had preached the gospel in that town and made many disciples, that is Derby, that is mentioned in verse 20, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith and by telling them it is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and after they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. After they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported everything that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they spent a considerable time 
with the disciples. Let's pray. Father, as we close this study in the first journey, we believe today that the gospel is as relevant as it has ever been, that the same message that was shared by Paul and Barnabas in the team is the message that we're called to carry in our community and around the world. Father, we thank you for the boldness that Paul and the team had. We thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that you gave them. And Father, as we enter this season of Christmas, what an opportunity, Lord, to advance the gospel through giving toward missions and Lottie Moon Christmas offering, toward opening our homes, inviting people in who do not know you, and engaging people in our work circles, in our family, in, the, in, the, in gospel conversation. And so, Lord, speak in this hour, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul is coming to the close of this journey here in Acts chapter 14, and we see the narrative. We see that he's finishing strong. He's going back to places he had visited earlier. He's even visiting a new place, Italia, and not knowing what the future held for him, and the future would be different. We're going to see in Acts chapter 15 that he and Barnabas would actually part ways over differences of strategy and philosophy of how to move forward in the ministry. And so Paul, not knowing whether he would return or not, wanted to make sure that the message that he was carrying, the ministry that he carried out, would be a perpetual ministry. And so as we close this six-week study, I, I want to note how Paul finished the trip, what he did for the churches that he had visited previously, and then we're going to see what he did after the trip and the conclusion as he shared uh, with the people who actually actually sent them out. You know, whether the messenger be the Apostle Paul or present-day Jonathan Isaac or you or me, we need to be convinced even today that the gospel of Jesus Christ is still transforming hearts from the inside out. Now, I want to note three things today as we close this study. And the first thing is this, advancing the gospel demands boldness. It demands boldness. It tells us in verse 21 that Paul and the team had visited three particular areas, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. That's not the Antioch of Syria that sent, but the Antioch of Pisidia that he visited very early in the early part of the year on this particular mission. Lest we forget uh, we must be reminded uh, of what happened in each of these places. In Lystra, Paul was stoned by the people and left for dead. In Iconium, they attempted to stone him, we've studied, and they chased them from uh, the city. In Antioch, they were persecuted and they were expelled from that area. And so now we see that the mission team, probably just a couple of months after this and no more than a few months after this, the team was going right back into these areas that had threatened them and they had no regard for their own physical well-being. And why was that? Because to them, gospel advancement was so important that they were willing to risk their own lives. Now, I tell you, for them and for you and me, that is not our default mode. Self-preservation is our nature. When you leave out of here, you would not knowingly drive the wrong way down uh, the highway. You wouldn't place your hand on a hot stove. Uh, we have this built-in sense of self-preservation, but Paul had this external impetus that was moving internally, and that was the conviction and, and the fact that he believed that the gospel was more important than his own physical well-being. And so he pre preached that message boldly. You know, Paul prayed for boldness. Do you ever pray for boldness? Have you had in your heart, Lord, I want to share with somebody, but yet there's been a nervousness about it. There's been an apprehension about it. We speak each Christmas of the truth that we have a built-in segue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because Christmas is about him. But maybe today you're nervous about it. You said, well, I, I have a burden for this person in the workplace, but every time I, I, I begin to say something, there's a distraction or I feel tongue-tied or I lack confidence. I want you to know as bold as 
Paul was, Paul realized he needed prayer. He asked others to pray that he would be bold. He asked for boldness himself. In Ephesians 6, 9, he wrote to the church at Ephesus. He said, pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I may what? Boldly make known the gospel's mystery. You know, the threats that were going against this team throughout the first missionary journey was that they might quieten Paul and the, and the others that were part of the team. But we must be convinced, as Paul was, that the gospel is so critical that we must overcome anything that would lead us in fear to not share that gospel. But I want you to see a second truth. Not only does advancing the gospel demand boldness, but it also demands more than just an initial touch. The missionary we mentioned earlier in prayer is going back for a second touch. By touch, I mean uh, another contact. One contact, usually initially you introduce the gospel, you do that, people become familiar. But many times in the strategy of many missionaries today, in the strategies of many missionaries who are Southern Baptists, is that it takes multiple touches and contacts with people that are being reached with the gospel. And so Paul and the team, they're circling back here in Acts, at the end of Acts chapter 14. Boldness from God empowered them to go back. And that answers the how. How were they able to do it? God had emboldened them to do it. But the, but the next question is why? Once how is answered, God boldly uh, enabled them to do that. The why is this. They had planted the seeds but it was their conviction that that was not enough. If the gospel were to advance, it would take more than just an initial contact with the gospel. There needed to be follow-up. And so we see here that they followed by strengthening and exhorting the individuals, by, by helping them in organization. When Paul left the churches earlier, they were infant churches. And so even as a parent would go back in the evening and check on that newborn, Paul with a spiritual parental attitude was coming back to these churches and checking how they were doing. They believed, but if they were to be true disciples, if they were to be advancers themselves of the gospel, they needed more. Paul's care for them was greater than for himself. I, I was laughing as I thought about sharing the gospel, and we have to um, sometimes give up our own personal comforts. I'm not saying that to boost uh, Carl uh, today, but Carl will remember this. We were in Brazil one time, and he and a guy named Mike Walters, I'd love to see Mike Walters again. He was a college student that was here, probably been... 10 years since I've seen him. But one thing we were always told when you go on these mission trips in third world countries and in areas, don't drink the water. We have bottled water. And so we set out one afternoon and in pairs and Carl and Mike Walters, um, they were visiting a guy, I believe they were sitting in the store. Maybe the guy even owned the store and they had just shared the gospel and guess what happened? The guy extended to them water. Now it wasn't bottled water, it was tap water. They drank it. Praise God, they didn't get sick. But you see what happened in that moment. We had the policy, and, and in general, that was the right policy. But at that moment, if they had rejected that water, everything that had been done for the gospel would have gone out the window because this guy would have thought, they're too good to receive what I offered. Why did Paul go back and risk this physical, this physical threat? He did so because he realized that these churches needed this second contact. Well, what three things did he do? First, he helped them through personal contact. We see it in, in verse 22. It says that he went back to Lystra, to Iconium, and Antioch. And for these three areas, there were three things that he did. He wanted to strengthen them, he wanted to encourage them, and he wanted to warn them. He wanted to strengthen these new believers. That literally meant that in the 
Greek, confirming in the soul, in the depths of the person, the truth of the gospel. And so that was a strengthening, a strengthening of the conviction. In spite of all of the outside persecution, the doubts that might arise, he came back to strengthen their souls and the conviction that the way of Christ is the only way. But not only that, he wanted to encourage them. He, he wanted to pat them on the back. He wanted to exhort them just as a runner in a long distance race would come near the end of the finish line. There would be people exhorting to finish. Paul is encouraging them, but then he also wanted to warn them. Notice what it says in verse 22, after he speaks of him strengthening and encouraging them, he says this, and it's quoted, it's necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. You know, many times when somebody as a Christian goes through difficulty, they must think, well, God's judging me. I must be doing wrong. That was not the case here. He said, one ought to. It is expected. It's not an anomaly. It's a norm that if you're following Christ, troubles will exist. I love that word troubles and the word picture. We've looked at it before. Uh, and it's the word thlipsis, which carries the idea of a pressing in from the outside. And that pressure, he said, is very real in the Christian life. He knew when he left these people that there would be adversity. And so he wanted them to know ahead of time the Christian life would not be easy. So you see Paul's heart here. He needed to come back. He needed to, to give these people a boost and to encourage and to exhort them. But I want you to see not only did he help them through personal uh, contact, but also through provisional construct. In other words, it tells us here that when they had appointed elders for them in every church and they prayed with fasting. In other words, they needed organization. They needed a structure. And many missionaries today, the desire is is to train the nationals that they might take ownership and leadership in the church. There were multiple elders here. Now, again, there are other parts of Scripture that describe church governance uh, more in a, a prescriptive way. But in this narrative, we see that this early church needed leaders, needed godly leaders. Now, uh, we don't know exactly who those elders would be. Many of them may have been young Christians, so you may not say, well, they weren't uh, overly mature in the Lord. It may have been that they were elderly people who had wisdom, but definitely people that Paul entrusted and felt were equipped to carry out the ministry. God is a God of order. There, there needs to be an order in his church, and God has prescribed that for the church. And so as Paul left these people, he encouraged them. He warned them it's going to be tough. He set a governance around them so that they might be able to follow good leadership. But then he also helped them through prayerful concern. Paul entrusted them to God. Look at what it, it says. After he had, they had appointed elders for them in every church, said they prayed with fasting committing them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Personally, and in the work of the church, there's only so much we can do. God must do it. And so Paul, while he was trying to help the church organize, while he was leaving with words of exhortation, of words of instruction, of counsel, he realized that he was limited. And so he said, we entrust you to God. He, he prayed and he fasted. And Paul headed right elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 3 when he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Paul was just a man. Barnabas was just a man. The, the people were just individuals. They were not the ones who would do it. God is the one. Anything done organizationally, administrative, ministry-wise, apart from God's will and God's power in the church is fruitless. It's true of everything, including what we're doing here at Concord. I like as Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, he says, I'm confident that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So Paul returned to these towns, to these cities. He encouraged them. He passed through Pisidia and Pamphylia in verse 24. He went back and spoke again in Perga and went down to a new territory in Italia. We see that he's finishing his work strong. But I want you to see the final point. Advancing the gospel involved connecting with the sending church. 
So we see that Paul in verses 26 through 28, he is returning to Antioch, not Antioch of Pisidia, but Antioch of Syria. It was a church that had divine direction and wisdom. It was a church that was prompted by the Holy Spirit not to keep its individuals in-house, but to send them out. It was a church that had the conviction that the gospel and the gospel alone is the answer that people need. And so in verse 26, it tells us that they, being Paul and the mission team, sailed back to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. In other words, they were given to God in prayer and sent out, and now they were returning. There was more work to be done. We might say this is a pit stop, just a short-term stop, but they needed to come back they needed to share with those who were vested in the ministry. They needed to hear what was going on. You know, I'm excited to tell you that I had mentioned Gary. And Gary uh, has been a real blessing uh, to me personally. Gary is the missionary that we're sponsoring that's going into a part of the world that is very remote. The gospel is not gone. He's working with a national pastor there who he's had contact with through video conference almost weekly. They've been praying together. It's been Gary's desire that he go to this place and that he be there uh, for an extended time of two to three weeks. And because of health limitations, he's not been able able to do so. As I shared earlier, we were able to sponsor his work. And so this morning at 827, almost a year after we uh, sent this money, he said, at my gate at the airport, waiting to fly out to join him to his work in this place until December 14. Thank you for helping to make this possible. Your partnership is changing the world. I'm thankful that the monies that God blessed us with could send this man round trip, that he might be able to do this ministry in an unreached area. You know, the early church had a missionary mindset. And so we see in verse 27 that they had a gathering. And that gathering said, after Paul and the team arrived, they gathered the church together and they reported everything God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Notice God received the glory. God had opened the door. God had done it. But they were excited to share with the church the results of that mission experience. You know, as we enter this holy season of Christmas, we're reminded the greatest missionary ever was Jesus. We've had a lot of great missionaries that have gone throughout this world, but Jesus himself traveled the greatest distance from heaven to earth at the greatest cost, his own life, to save us. And we, we have that example that we should follow. In this season, we have the opportunity to do as the church in Antioch was able to do in Antioch of Syria to send out missionaries. Not only the one that we're sponsoring over these next two weeks, but through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we have an opportunity to support mission work around the world. There's still work to do. I just received some uh, facts this past week. In the last full calendar year of 2022, through Southern Baptist International Mission, 67 new people groups have been engaged with the gospel. But to give you a perspective, as great as that is, they're still estimated between 3,000 and 7,000 unreached people groups. It may be just a remote tribe of 25 people in a mountainous area somewhere, but the, the differences in calculation is still an extensive number where little or no gospel is brought. But every year we're chipping away. And you know what? through the technology, through the gifts, through the conviction of the church, this gospel will go to every people group. Jesus made that clear in the Olivet Discourse. Isn't it great that we can be a part of it? I wonder today, are you committed in your part of the world, in your workplace, in your home,
wherever you might be in the marketplace to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you willing financially to support the work of missions that's going throughout the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, supporting and taking care of those missionaries who are doing the work in places that you and I can never visit? I, I, I am so impressed as I, I looked at this and I, I think of what, how exciting it must have been for the church at Antioch to have that team report and say, man, God's doing a great work. May we be faithful and do our part, our part. We can't do everything, but do what God has called us to do to advance the gospel. Let's pray. Father, as we have looked today, we believe with all our heart that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer. Father, sometimes that makes us be in a position where we must stand against social injustice. We must stand for righteous things. But Lord, keep us mindful that apart from faith in Jesus Christ and things centered on you, everything else is futile. Father, there may be some today who have never trusted in Jesus Christ, who have never publicly let anyone know that they're a believer in you. I pray today would be that day. Father, there may be some uh, here today or listening elsewhere who are struggling with the boldness to share. I pray, Lord, you would give them boldness, give them wisdom, give them a segue to share the gospel and give them confidence in that you're working in it. And Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.